Hello and welcome to One on One Shadow Boxing. This episode today has got a guest, John McBain. John, I know you almost more than a decade. Tell us something about yourself, what you are, who you are, what you do. Basically, I try and live my life to make a better nation. And I do that in any way that I please. Um, the, I'm on several NGOs. Um, ANTAR, which was originally Australians for Native Title and Reconciliation, so I'm the chair in WA and I sit on their National Management Committee. We advocate for justice rights and respect for Aboriginal people. One question I always ask people is, can you say hello in French? And they say bonjour. Can you say hello in Indonesian? And they say whatever that is. Can you say hello in the language that's been spoken where you're standing and living for over 50,000 or 30,000 years and they just look at you like... So and then I say, how's, well... How's hello then? Kaya. 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 Mudish maam. Mudish yogas. Mudish kulangas. Wanju, wanju, nungabuja. And that means hello, good men, good women, good children. Welcome together on Noongar country. So how, what's your connection with the Aborigines? And how have you been involved? I've been given the great privilege of accepted into Aboriginal law in the Pilbara region, so where my, a lot of our iron ore comes from, home of the oldest known petroglyphs in the world at the Burrup Peninsula. And, um, but besides that, I've had yes. a lot of social interaction with Aboriginal people. I lived with a girl for quite a while she was stolen generation. She had brothers die in police custody and um, amazing muso and artist. So I've just had that ongoing involvement with Aboriginal people. My perspective in terms of Aboriginal stuff is that our country um, is missing out on engaging Aboriginal people by continually alienating them maybe without even knowing that we're doing that. I don't think it's a deliberate action, but I think it's a great shame, not just for the Aboriginal people, which is a real shame, but it's a, a great tragedy for our whole nation, whether you're talking about the people or the country itself, because their wisdom has been gained over, you know, 30, 50,000 years, whereas our so-called wisdom has been gained in this country over a couple of hundred. But I told the British got all the wisdom in the world and the money, so that's why they conquered the world and they kept the world in tight hands for more than 200 years. Mm. Rub the world, make the money from everything. So, not the Aborigines, man. I mean, they just lived in here. Mm. How do you see that? Well, look, I wouldn't blame it all on the English. They weren't the only nation that was so ignorant. No? There were other nations, the Dutch, the Spanish, and in latter days, the Americans and probably the Russians and the Chinese. I think it's more of a human thing than purely English. So where is the wisdom then? Wisdom is not a human thing. I think the wisdom lies with ordinary people. Yeah? And you mean common sense? Yeah. And, you know, but going back to the English thing, because I can't let that pass, <laughs> the, the idea that a lady, um, whether she's a nice lady or not, I'm not sure, I haven't met her, she seems pretty good. But I'm sure it, a lot of it stayed managed. But what I've seen of her, she seems like a nice enough old lady. But she does live on the other side of the planet. And why we ever accepted that our head of state would be an old lady who lives on the other side of the planet is a little bit confusing. Look, the issue of sovereignty is a, is a really important question in this country. You know, people are talking about being, whether we're going to be a republic. Well. Let's discuss that issue after we've dealt with the real issue. The real issue is, in our moral codes and our laws, violent theft is illegal. That's how this nation was established. Now, whether we're going to deal with it by giving the Aboriginals sovereignty, control of the upper houses of parliament, 
or whatever doesn't matter much. It's not how we deal with it, it's the fact that we attempt to deal with it. Because until we do that, Aboriginal people know this is their land. Always was, always will be. That's what Aborigines say. Now, when the Bible says that it's a sin to steal or steal with violence, and our, our laws, Australian and English, say you cannot gain proper title to something by an illegal act, and I would presume most people think violent theft <laughs> is an illegal act, that leaves Australia with some fairly serious issues to deal with. When you build a house, the first thing is solid foundations. I love my country, right? but I'm ashamed of it at the same time because th this country is built on suspect foundations. Until we address that, we're a laughing stock of the rest of the world. Look, at, we're going overseas trying to tell countries how to have democracy, you know, running along behind um, America, and um, yeah. who just did what we did in establishing this country. They did it 300 years earlier. In this country, democracy, at the point of colonisation, Aboriginal people were 100% of the population, or very close to it. Maybe there was a few Dutch or whatever yeah. walking around somewhere. We gave them, the Aboriginal people, the vote when they got to under 5%. And now we want to go to Iraq and tell them how to do democracy. They must think we're a joke. They should. They should think that, but what's the solution? Solutions are really hard to find in this world. And I'm not a great believer in solutions. So I'm a bit more pragmatic than that, I like to think. I think it's about slow steps forward in the right direction. And to me, the first step in democracy and establishing national validity is saying to the Aboriginal people, this should be your land. Right? Someone told me a week ago in Canberra at the 10th Embassy mm. that the old Parliament House should be given immediately to the Aboriginal people and having their Parliament there, which is the old Parliament. Yeah, yeah I've heard that said. I've got a different view. I think our present politicians should move out of the new Parliament House yes. and they go in the old Parliament House and let the Aborigines have the new one. <laughs> Why should we continually give Aboriginals second best on their own country? I don't have the answer on that one, unfortunately, myself. But mm. uh, tell us something about your involvement with the Barab. Well, you know, as I said, I, I was um, accorded status in Aboriginal law and culture. It's not normally something that you stand up and say, but I'm just saying it in this context, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. And this was two, over two years ago now, and I'm still actually coming to terms with that privilege, and it, it's an amazing thing. The man who ran those law ceremonies, um, Tim Douglas, Dad Tim, I call him, he was... Um, He's the custodian of the Barrett Peninsula rock art. And he has that status because he has that direct spiritual connection to that place through song and dance and stories. Unfortunately, like in many other parts of Australia, the original custodians of that were, were all massacred. So what's important in the Barat for everyone, for the world, and why not the state government and our national government is do more to protect the art at the, uh, at the Barat? Look, that, that's an, an incredibly good question, and it's a question that a lot of us think about a lot of the time. I'm buggered if I know. It just amazes me. If I went to the MCG with a chainsaw, I'd be in jail within five minutes. And yet we, we have destroyed already nearly 10% of the oldest rock art in the world and, and no one's ever been held to account for it. And let me say, it's not about blame. It's about let's stop being so bloody stupid, right, and start recognising the real stuff in this country, like our rivers, like our forests. I won't digress into the new so-called forest management plan. I call it a mismanagement plan. But, the, you know, we've got to respect the land we walk on. How can you respect yourself 
if you can't even respect the country, if you don't have a cultural connection to that country. And that's what Aboriginal people have over the rest of us, if, is they have, through millennia or whatever you call it, developed that cultural direct connection to country, it's tied up with language, all those sort of things. Why hasn't the Burrup received World Heritage recognition? Why hasn't it yet been recommended by the Australian Government for World Heritage recognition? That's a question only the particular politicians can answer because I can't think of any valid answer. Probably industry got more money than protect the Burrup, just destroy it. Well, see, if we want to live in a world, whether it's in Perth, nationally, globally, where money takes precedence over everything. I mean, it was said years ago, something about you can't eat money, right? Everyone's heard that saying by Chief Seattle or whatever. And I've chewed on a few coins that, you know, that's why I haven't got so many teeth. Look, we need a different value system, and that's one of the things Aboriginal culture can offer us, is that respect for country, respect for family, respect for culture. Unfortunately, in Australia, we don't have culture. We think football and barbecues and drinking pisses, or am I allowed to say that? Yeah, of course. Is that's part of Australian culture. <laughs> that's why you can say yeah. it. Well, you, we think that's culture, right? And I, you know, I quite like all those things. And right? then Colin um, Barnett comes up. In fact, up I think I'm very good at most of them. <laughs> and then Colin Barnett comes up in WA and say, building a $1 billion stadium, that's your present kids, mm. instead of spending $1 billion on protecting the world heritage art yeah. in the build-up. And I don't think it would take anything like a billion dollars. What I'd like to see, I'd like to see world heritage protection for all of the rock art in Australia, not just the borough. See, when we form Friends of Australian Rock Art, it's so far mainly been campaigning on the borough because that yes. is under immediate threat. But the truth is... It's under destruction already. So oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's just amazing. The idea that you can have a big industrial plant right next to this stuff and that the whatever's coming out of the chimney isn't going to mix with moisture and degrade that rock art, which is one of the focuses the government has had over the last decade since we established FARA about the borough, proving they've got the CSIRO to prove that fall out from the sky and that industrial plant's not going to harm the Borough Peninsula rock art. <laughs> well, that is just the biggest joke I've ever heard in my life. Antar. Well, Antar... Before you go into that question, Antar, yeah. we should go and have a short break. And okay. coming back after the break to have more discussion with John McBain.